We're going to be talking tonight about origins of the church. Origins of the church. The church has always been a part of God's plan. So this lesson will lay down the foundation for understanding that the church was not an invention of the New Testament writers, but actually has its very roots in the Old Testament. And these roots help us to appreciate what the church is and the fruit it should bear. In addition to it, uh, what we're going to be looking at, the highlights of this, is the ongoing presence of Jesus Christ working through his people and the promise of the Holy Spirit to empower the church to be witnesses of Jesus in the world. And then finally, we're going to look at the foundational importance of the apostles and that the failure of Judas was actually foretold in the Old Testament along with scriptural instruction for another apostle to be appointed to take Judas's place. So when you say that nothing has caught God by surprise, it's the truth. But let me ask you this question. What is the church? We are. So it's not the brick and mortar, the sheep rock, the shingles. It's not the concrete foundation, the carpet or the pews. It's the people. The Greek word for church is Ecclesia, which literally means assembly or congregation. So think about the idea of church as a congregation of believers rather than the building. If we were not here, this building would still be here. And though others may look at it as being a church, without its people, it's just another building. So if we had no building, how would we invite people to church? I like that. Amen. Yes, being a witness and inviting them would be, and living it out before them would be a way of inviting people to church. For someone to see the trials and tribulations you go through, and then want to know how it is you got through those trials and tribulations. And then we're able to point to Jesus and say, because of what he did. It's not what I do. It's what he does. So if you would think of a virtual or online church, do you think that that would be a way of replacing the physical or the corporate uh, assembling of ourselves together of believers in Christ? Do you think that watching a TV pastor would ever take the place of coming to church? Are you sure? No, I'm joking. I'm glad. I'm glad. I I I, I I can tell when I haven't made it to my church services. I enjoy coming to church. I enjoy meeting and, and being with each and every one of you and, and conversing and then making fun of Sister Esther. No, nah, no, nah, let me stop. She's not here to defend herself, so I, I, can't, I can't say too much about her. <laughs> Amen. Yes, we are glad when they said, let us come into the house of the Lord. So beginning in a few verses, we're going to look at Acts chapter 7, verses 37 through 38. And then we're going to flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 9 through 14. And we are going to be jumping around a little bit. Uh, but the majority of our scriptures are going to be out of Acts. Acts chapter 7. Verses 
37 and 38 says, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Then flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Verses 9 through 14. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligent, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. And ye came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire unto the midst of heaven with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude. Only ye heard a voice, and he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even ten commandments. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that ye might do them in the land whither ye go over to possess it. So beginning with the words of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, in his defense before the council, his words reveal that the early church saw itself in con continuity with the Old Testament assembly of believers. Stephen provided a historical overview of Israel as the people of God, but then enraged the council by noting the many failures of Israel in how they treated the prophets and also Jesus. As part of this review, Stephen said God promised he would raise up one like Moses whom the people would hear. Stephen added that Moses was in the church in the wilderness that we saw in verse 37. The church then being the Israelites who assembled in the wilderness as the congregation of the Lord. And it was at this gathering of the people of God that prefigured the church in the New Testament. So Stephen was likely referring to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, where Moses spoke to Israel, reminding them of the day they stood before the Lord at Mount Sinai. Recounting that event, Moses said, The Lord told him to gather the people and that the Lord would speak to them the words they were to teach their children and their grandchildren. Moses recalled that the people gathered as instructed and then God spoke to them from the midst of the fire. It was an awesome moment accompanied by fire on the mountain, darkness, clouds, and most in, of most importance, the audible voice of God. To Moses, God had given two tablets of stone on which were written by God the Ten Commandments. God commanded the Israelites to obey these commandments throughout all their generations. The Word of God was and would remain central to Israel's identity and life as God's people who were chosen by Him to fulfill a redemptive destiny. They were called for a purpose and they heard his voice 
I've even in my own life have said at different times, if I would just hear his voice, then I would know that I know that I know. Or if he would just tell me to turn left, I'll turn left. Or if he would just tell me to make a right turn, I'll make a right turn. If he would just tell me, if he would just talk to me. And, and we think, you know, hey, that's, that's reasonable thinking. Well, here these people were, and they heard, and they still rebelled. I can remember having to wait in my room because I was a bad boy, and I was getting ready to get my tail cut, and I'd be in the room praying, Lord, please let Daddy forget. If you would just let Daddy forget about this tail cutting, I promise you I'll serve you for the rest of my life. I don't know that that ever worked, but hey. Yes, ma'am. I'm here. So let me ask a few questions. What similarities can we find between God meeting with the Israelites at Mount Sinai and God meeting with us in our corporate worship? That is a question. What similarities can we find between God meeting with the Israelites at Mount Sinai and God meeting with us in our corporate worship? Amen. Amen. So when he says, whosoever will, let him come, it's the same as it was then as it is now. Now, there's a difference in that there aren't the little dividers that are put up. There's a difference that he's not allowing them to go too close to the mountain. Or you, if you remember, he was saying to even remove the animals from in that area because once he descended to the mountain and his presence would engulf that mountain if you came too close or if those animals were to come too close they would die but he still came at their backing why did he come for them to hear Because they asked for it. They said, Moses, how do we know that this is real? You go up and then you come down and you tell us. We want to hear it with our own ears. We want to see it with our own eyes. I guess they were from Missouri. The show me state. That's what they had. I don't know if they still do, but that's what they used to have on their license plate. Missouri, the show me state. They wanted to see it with their own eyes. They wanted to, to see him and to experience him and to, to hear his voice. And they got their wish. He said, okay, that's no big deal. Now, we have to make sure that we're going to keep them safe. But they'll ask the questions, and I'll give the answers. Then what happened? Amen. They said, man, to hear his voice, we're likely to die. It is so hard of a thing for us to be able to hear him. We don't want to do this anymore. Moses, you go on up the way things were. You talk with him, and then you come down and tell us, and we'll believe you from now on. Yeah, right. They lied then too, didn't they? All right, so Stephen cited the promise that God would raise up a prophet like Moses, as we saw here in Acts chapter 7. He told them, he brought back to their remembrance 
that God had promised to raise up a prophet like Moses. So what parallels do you see between Jesus and Moses? These are some hard questions, aren't they, Sister Mary? <laughs> they both heard the voice of God. Jesus was God the Son, so you know he heard the voice of God the Father. Moses heard the voice of God. Moses wanted to see God's face, didn't he? God even called him a friend. God even told him at times when those people were t getting on his last nerve and bouncing on it like a diving board, stand back, Moses. I'm going to wipe them out and start over with you, man. He was an intercessor, wasn't he? Isn't that what Jesus is for us? Didn't he tell us, that if you pray in my name, what happens? It's not just you asking for it, but it's me asking for it too. But the difference is, you're going to be here praying. I'm going to be at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you. So yes, very good, very good. Psalm 22 We're going to look at verses 22 through 25. Psalm 22, verses 22 through 25. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye, the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel, for he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard, My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. So here in this psalm, David spoke of being in the midst of the congregation where he did six things. First, he declared the name of the Lord to the brethren. Then he praised God. He exhorted others in the congregation to join him in praising the Lord. He reminded the afflicted that God had not forgotten them. He told the people that God hears them when they cry out to him. And then finally, he says, I will pay my vows before them. Meaning he will keep his commitments before them. This is a great example for the church today. All six of these things are appropriate activities in the great congregation meaning for us the church speaking the powerful name of the Lord praising and worshiping and encouraging others praying and keeping our commitments are all elements of dynamic and edifying worship services it is this model found in the Old Testament and it continues to provide a worship example for Christian congregations. So David, as you know, was a musician known to play the harp. As found in 1 Samuel chapter 16 where King Saul had, was vexed by a spirit. And so David was hired to come in and to play his harp to appease and to silence his torment. So he, it is certain that David would affirm musical instruments to accompany praise and worship in the church. And one should not miss the celebratory nature of David's worship in the congregation. 
and any church would be well served to embrace this model of worship. Now, you have to be careful how you describe this because when you study King David, he, there was a time where he danced before the Ark of the Covenant, bringing it into, the, uh, into Jerusalem or Bethlehem. Bethlehem. And he danced himself out of his robe. And, and among other articles of clothing. So be, be careful. You know, yes, praise the Lord. Worship, sing, but leave your clothes on. So what similarities can we see between David's description of praise and worship in the congregation and many, listen to this now, and many Pentecostal worship models. You got to make sure that you're saying it that way because there are a lot of Pentecostal churches that doesn't seem to be very Pentecostal anymore. When everybody is, I'm not going to name any names, but there are churches out there where if you say amen, to whatever's being preached, everybody looks at you as if you have just committed a sin. I went to a church. Bobby and Hannah was about two years old, a little under two years old, and the preacher was preaching. And I mean, he was preaching good. And Bobby says, amen. Everybody stopped and looked at us. And that preacher says, Y'all quit looking at that little man. I needed that. <laughs> I needed to know that I was on the right path. Y'all need to come more often. Well, I was living in South Carolina. And we were in Mississippi at the time. So it, there are churches that frown upon that type of worship. That is worship. Affirmation of what's being preached is a form of worship. When you raise your hands, when the Lord is moving in, in the midst as the preacher's preaching, and you're raising your hand, that's affirmation. That's a form of worship. So a lot of Pentecostal churches are dying away from that because they're watering it down to the point that there is no more move of the Spirit. So... What similarities can we see between David's description of praise and worship in the congregation and many Pentecostal model worship services today? David was free-spirited, wasn't he? Yes, yes. He wasn't over in the corner He was playing it. I could, man, I could just see him over in the corner. Come on, step it up, man. The beat's there. Get the beat going. Pick it up. There it is. Thinking of the description Moses gave of God speaking audibly to Israel when they assembled at the foot of Mount Sinai in Horeb, along with the description of corporate worship given by David in Psalm 22. Let us consider ways we can engage in worshiping God and faithfully obeying his word. David celebrated God's presence and goodness in corporate worship, praising God, and Moses reminded Israel that the word of the Lord was to go with them and govern their lives. We do not have to choose between the worshipful praise of God and the ministry of the word of God in corporate worship. Both are essential components of the spiritually healthy corporate worship of a church. Let me say that again. 
We don't have to choose between one or the other. Do we choose between worshipful praise of God and the ministry of the word of God? No, they go hand in hand. They're both essential components of the spiritually healthy corporate worship of a church. So let us always choose to have both. The Lord should have his freedom in our lives because it's our lives that make up the church. Do you see what I'm saying? And he should have his freedom to be able to move in our life. He should have his freedom to be able to move in our congregation. Not just when we're here, but when we are out and about, when we're at food lines, when we're at work, people should be able to see that there's something different about you. Acts chapter 1. Verses 1 through 5 says... The former treatise I have I made, I O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of, some, uh, of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence." So the Gospels, as we see, Jesus choosing the living stones from which to build his church. Those stones were the disciples. He called and taught his disciples and he chose 12 men to be his apostles. Men who would retain and replicate his ministry and his message. Jesus knew he would return to the Father and said it was beneficial for his disciples that he go because when he went, he would send the Holy Spirit to lead them in all truth as found in John chapter 14. The book of Acts opens with Jesus preparing to leave his disciples, telling them to wait for the promise of the Father, the baptism with the Holy Spirit, that would provide the spiritual power needed for effective ministry. Luke began the book of Acts by referring to the former treatise, that is the gospel by Luke, and said that in it he provided information concerning all that Jesus began both to do and to preach that we see in verse 1 here in the book of Acts chapter 1. So the implication of this was that the work of Jesus would continue through the church because he was just getting started in the Gospels. For 40 days following his resurrection, Jesus continued speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That is, Jesus was informing his disciples about the reign of God in the hearts and lives of believers in him and then when it was time for him to depart, he told them to wait in Jerusalem until they had been baptized with the Holy Spirit. So to see where we're all at in our mindset, let me ask, why? Why do you think Jesus was telling them to go back and wait?
So you don't think that they had the power within themselves to be able to do it? I agree. No. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Anything that we try to do in our own power is doomed to fail. I, I don't want to do anything that the Holy Spirit isn't a part of. And, and that, that pertains to writing a program for the CNC machines that I work with at work or making parts or, I mean, repairing machines. I, I, don't, I don't want... Like the song says, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. That's the truth. And I, I've said it before. The, the, I heard of, of a, a little uh, picture, uh, word picture on the radio one time of, of this man and his wife was driving home in the ice and snow. And they lived up in the mountain country somewhere. Yeah, I know some people are crazy. But anyway, uh, and I'm as an ex-truck driver, I know that for sure because I used to drive through those terrains and I, I would not do that in a car. So at any rate, this guy was driving along and his wife was in constant prayer because they were driving on ice and snow all through this mountainous terrain. And then they get to the very end of the road where their driveway is. And the husband says, okay, Lord, that's enough. We got it from here. And they did a 360 right there in their driveway. So at that point, when it was, the Lord took his hands off. I could just see it. Okay, dude, you got it. It's all yours. Oh, wait, did you just mess up? Let me put my hand back on you now. Lord, I don't want you to let go. I don't even care if I pull up in my driveway. Take me all the way back into the house. Keep your hands on me while I'm in the house. Keep your hands on me while I'm asleep. Keep your hands on me when I wake up. Keep your hands on me when I go to work. Keep your hands on me when I set up the machine. Keep your hands on me when I get off. Keep your hands on me when I get home. I, I don't want you to let go. That's right. I used to have a bumper sticker, not a bumper sticker, but a license plate uh, on the front of a pickup truck I had that said, God is my pilot. And I was at the pilot gas station. This woman walked by and says, you're in the wrong seat. I said, excuse me? Ma'am, I'm sorry. What are, you, what are you saying? She says, I'm talking about your little license plate. You need to read that again, ma'am. And she went around to the front, and she goes, and I mean, her color dropped out of her face. She says, I am so sorry. I misread that. I said, ma'am, I understand. You thought it said co-pilot, cool didn't you? She said, I sure did. I said, no, ma'am. I'm not the pilot of this ship. He is. I don't even want to be the co-pilot. Cool I think I'd rather be the engineer in the background who's trying to just keep up. Let, let him and him alone take the reins. So regarding the Old and New Covenants, in what way is Luke's comment that Jesus had given commandments that we see in verse 2 similar to Moses giving God's commandments to the Israelites? These are some hard questions, ain't they, Dad? <laughs> Regarding the Old and New Covenants, in what way is Luke's comment that Jesus had given commandments that we see in verse 2 similar to Moses giving God's commandments to the Israelites? Yes, sir. But the, the question is, 
with the commandments that he's given them here, how is it similar to what Moses did in giving the Ten Commandments? Now, you've got to realize what, what the question is taken, in, is taken for granted. It isn't Moses giving them his commandments. Yes, ma'am? I like that. He, he assimilated all the commandments into one in that he lived it all, proved it all, and showed it all. Is that what you're saying? So you're saying where the... Uh, lawyer comes to him and asks him what is the greatest commandment and he says love God with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind and then he said and the one that is second to that and is close to it is to love your neighbor as yourself and if you keep those two because on those two all the other commandments are hinged upon so in other words if you love God with all your heart with all your soul with all your might that and you love your neighbor as yourself, all the rest of it would be easy pickings. Is that what you're saying? Well, it's not that I can do that. I'm asking if that's what you're saying because you're the one that's bringing it here, Mama. <laughs> that's, that's my final answer, okay. I can live with that. Jesus lived it out before everybody. Moses gave it to everybody as it was given to him. And the one that was giving it to him is living it out. I could see that. So Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelopes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. The disciples did as Jesus commanded them. They went back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives and gathered in an upper room, which many believe was the same upper room where Jesus had instituted the Lord's Supper and his disciples, uh, with his disciples. On this occasion, however, Judas Iscariot was not present, but 11 of the 12 apostles were identified by name. Forty days earlier, all 12 apostles had been with Jesus as he broke the bread, saying, Take, eat. This is my body. And then took the cup, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. It is the covenant in my blood which is shed for you. This time the apostles with other disciples were gathered in the upper room and remained there together, waiting with one accord in prayer and supplication, as we see in verse 14. And it is their lives that have been turned upside down by the events of the past 40 days. But they came together in unity with prayer and supplication, which means they were seeking and asking Father God for the promise that is the Holy Spirit. 
gathered with the apostles were the women, which included Jesus' mother Mary. In all about 120 believers, as we're going to see, were gathered together in verse 15, obeying, uh, obediently waiting to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They did not know how or when it would happen, but they believed and prayed the promise would come just as Jesus said it would. So he told them to wait, it's coming. So they went and waited, and they were praying for that to happen. So why do you think that they through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that Luke would include the comment here. This is kind of a loaded question, so please don't, don't throw stones my way. Why do you think Luke, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, included the comment that there were women disciples among those that gathered in the upper room? All right, why was Mary the only one that was named? Why was Mary, the mother of Jesus, the only female named? I didn't say it was the only female. That's not the question. Why, why is it that when I ask these questions, y'all like to twist it around and not answer the question and try and throw things back on me? We'll go with that, Ma. Jesus continues his work through the church, and we, as members of his church, should give our serious attention to what he desires to do through each of us. He promised the power to do what he asks us to do. And if we have not yet been baptized with the Holy Spirit, we should pray and believe for this precious promise to fill us with His presence and power. We do not have to beg. We do not have to plead for that promise. All we need to do is to only ask and believe and be patient. Verses 15 through 20 says, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about an hundred and twenty. Men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. And following headlong, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, Aseldama. That is to say, the field 
of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and his bishopric let another take. So while Jesus' disciples waited in the upper room, the apostle Peter spoke to them about the need to fill Judas's place among the twelve. Peter respected the fact that Jesus had chosen twelve men as apostles. But with the defection and suicide of Judas Iscariot, there were now only eleven. Peter said the betrayal of Jesus by Judas was the fulfillment of a prophecy in Scripture found in a psalm by David. Now Peter was likely referring to Psalm 41 verse 9 which states, Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. After citing this prophecy, Peter told his audience that Judas, one of the twelve, had betrayed Jesus and in the act of committing suicide brought on himself a horribly gruesome death. This formal gathering of Jesus' disciples in the upper room was presided over by the apostle Peter who had a specific purpose in mind, that of replacing Judas with a twelfth apostle. Peter acknowledged the failure of one of their own, but the failure of one did not negate the ministry or the mission of the apostles and the church. While the actions of Judas fulfilled prophetic scripture, this did not exonerate him, but informed Jesus' disciples that nothing Satan brings against Christ and his church catches God by surprise let me say that again while the actions of Judas fulfilled prophetic scripture what does that mean that means that it was already spoken of in the Old Testament it did not catch God by surprise is what this is saying it informed his disciples that nothing that Satan does will catch God by surprise when we read the book of Job, God is sitting there and the sons are coming before him. And who comes in amongst them? Satan. And so what does God do? He asks him a question. What you been up to, dude? Now that's Brad vernacular. What you been up to, bud? Long time no see. Where you been? Oh, I've just been walking to and fro. Well, have you considered my servant, Job? God already knew the outcome. I, I saw a t-shirt one time that says, if you think God's against gambling, read the book of Job. And I told the dude, I said, I've read Job. He didn't gamble. Gambling is when you are betting against something you don't know the outcome of. If you know the outcome, it's no longer gambling. And he knew the outcome. There was no bet on God's part. So do you think formal church business meetings are a waste of time? Or would you say that the example of Acts demonstrates what such meetings, that such meetings are necessary? It's not just from that time. It's right on to now. There are a lot of people that will tell you that the Bible is no longer relevant, that there are so many changes in society. But if you start reading the very words, you see that everything from the very beginning to now is still just as relevant. There's still these things going on. Read Sodom and Gomorrah in there. They're still happening. Verses 21 through 26, finishing out this chapter, says, 
Wherefore, of these men which have, have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas be trans, uh, by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So let me ask you, what was the reason for maintaining twelve apostles? Why? Twelve tribes? It is believed Jesus chose the twelve apostles to represent the people of God under the new covenant or the new testament. In much the same way the twelve sons of Jacob, heading the twelve tribes of Israel, represented the people of God under the old covenant or the old testament. Thus the twelve tribes representing Old Testament believers and the twelve apostles representing New Testament believers represent the redeemed people of God from all time. And this is even indicated in the book of Revelation by the 24 elders seated around the throne of God as found in Revelation chapter 4. So you had the 12 from the Old Testament and you had 12 from the New Testament. You have... It used to be that it would be the old will and testament and the new will and testament. That's, I remember when the Bibles used to say that. Of course, I was a kid. Uh, they don't say that anymore. They, they just say either New Testament or Old Testament or some you'll even see that say Old Covenant and New Covenant. But it's the old will and testament and it became completed at the death of Jesus Christ. And now we are in the New Testament, the new will and testament. A little bit of school in there. Huh? That was free. Peter said Judas's replacement would have to be a disciple who had followed Jesus from the beginning and had continued with him until his ascension. The church identified two men meeting the, that requirement, Joseph called Barsabbas and Matthias, with these two candidates before them. The disciples prayed, asking God to reveal which one he had chosen to take Judas's place. And then, as was customary for that time, they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, who was then numbered with the other 11 apostles. Now, casting lots was the practice of tossing a small marked stone or stick on the ground, on a table, or even into someone's lap, and then discerning the meaning based on how the lots fell. Now, in this case, each of the 11 had a lot and tossed it down with the result being that Matthias was chosen. Does that remind anybody of anything? No? All right, let me bring to your remembrance the flipping a coin. Heads or tails? Everybody's played that game, right? I know I'm, I'm not the only one. Everybody's looking at me like I'm crazy. But that's just the same mindset. Heads or tails? And so if they said heads, it's lot, uh, Lot. Heads, it's uh, Barsabbas, or tails, it's Matthews. Or they might have said, heads, it's him, and tails, it's him. 
So, you know, either way he'd win. Who knows? But that's probably how I'd have played it anyway. So in this case, each of the 11 had a lot and tossed it down, and with the result being that Matthias was chosen. Now, there is no record of the church ever using this method again. But God honored it in this instance. Now, some suggest Paul should be regarded as the 12th apostle. But there is no scriptural support for this idea. So according to Luke, Matthias replaced Judas. And it stands to reason. Because Paul wasn't a part of the ministry of Jesus while Jesus was here. Did he see Jesus? Yes. And the light shone so brightly upon him that it blinded him for a season. I can see that. But he didn't fit the same description as the rest of them did. He wasn't a part of the mix during Jesus' ministry. So what are some of the reasons you may have read or heard from others for the need to maintain exactly 12 apostles? I like it. I don't see how that, that answers the question, though, but we'll move on. What methods do you believe are biblical for a church to use to fill leadership positions? And what methods should you think are not biblical? What methods do you believe are biblical for a church to use to fill leadership positions? All right, so what method did they use, Mama, to fill that position of Judas? Did I? Mama? Yes, ma'am. They they. they through lots. All right. So that was the method that they used, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Dad, you raise your hand. So that's, that's the method that they used. All right. So what methods do you believe are biblical for a church to use to fill leadership positions? So we need to know that they are able to to do the job. Now they, they set into place what it meant to be an apostle. They had to be a part of Jesus' ministry. They were disciples of Jesus directly before his death. They knew that he died. They saw that he died. They saw that he was raised from the dead. And then they were there when he ascended into heaven. So that was the ground rules for being an apostle. So they lined themselves up with his word. So that's what we need to have when we are looking for people that we're putting into leadership positions. We don't want people in leadership positions in our church that does not have the heart of the church. It is when you have someone in a leadership position that it's not about you, it's about me, there's a problem. And when, when you have people in a leadership position that are more out for you than themselves, then you tend to grow, 
and you become stronger. People do move away because if you continue to read the book of Acts, because of the tribulation, they spread out, which caused the word to go throughout all the world. And it's still moving. So what methods do you think are not biblical? Amen. Politics. Who, who's the, the good old boy or the good old girl? I should be a part of this church. My daddy was a preacher. My, mom, my, my daddy's daddy was a preacher. And my daddy's daddy's daddy was a preacher. So therefore, I should be a preacher. That's the wrong way of looking at it too. That'll tear up a church in a heartbeat. While church members do not always see the need for business meetings, this study reveals that such meetings are needed at times to address various important issues that arise. This lesson also reveals that these meetings should be characterized by prayer, serious consideration based on biblical principles, and unity among the members. Therefore, we should encourage one another to attend business meetings of the church and to be led by the word and spirit of God as we make decisions for the well-being of the church. Now this particular church has what they call the church and pastor's council. I'm one, Brother Rogers one, Jonathan Gilruth is the other. We, when we are in, out and about, the way that I look at it is we represent the pastor. But when we come together and we are meeting with the pastor, we represent the church. If it becomes something that we have to vote on that is outside of a certain dollar limit, or if we feel that it is something that is greater than what we should be allowed to do, we'll give options, and those options will be presented to the church body. So we meet more often than the church body meets for these business meetings to help the church not be bogged down by all the details. But when it comes to a point that it feels too heavy for us to bear, we give options and then we bring it to the church. And when those meetings happen, I, I implore you, make yourself available. It ends up being a little bit after the morning service. But make yourself available. Show your support because we need your support. We represent you when we are meeting with the pastor. We represent him when we're in here with you. So that's the way I look at it. And we, we have a really good pastor, really good team. The book of Acts tells how the ministry and message of Jesus should continue through believers in him. And as we expand his kingdom through our spirit, empowered ministries and our testimonies of his amazing grace. So with that, this Saturday I would like to tell the men that are in this room and the men that are maybe watching this on Facebook or social, other social media. Men's breakfast at Perkins in Somerville, 8 o'clock. I expect to see you if you're off. <laughs> but if you're working, I understand. But I would love to see you there. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we glorify you, and we thank you, Lord, for the fact of knowing that you've put all this into place from the very beginning. We look throughout the Old Testament and we see where the congregation was put together. We see how you put the different people into place. We even studied uh, through life group where Moses said, should that the Holy Spirit fall upon all people that they all should prophesy. 
And Lord, we see it coming to fruition. And we know that it is going to continue on into everlasting. We thank you, Lord, for your promises. We thank you, Lord, for your word. And we thank you, Lord, for the desire you've placed in our heart to learn more about you and the relationship you so desired to have with us that you did endure the cross. Be with us as we go to our respectable abodes. And I pray that you be with our pastor as he travels and allow us to come back at the next appointed time. We love you, Lord. We praise you and we glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.